Welcome to Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce Commander Tony Coverdale, Royal Navy retired. But before I start, if you look at the bottom of the screen to chat and give it a click, if you have a question, you can type your question in on chat and then at the end Tony's um, this very kindly agreed to take questions. We can start with the questions that are on chat. Well, my good friend Tony Coverdale is no stranger to talking at Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. I was reading earlier a report on his talk in 2011 to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers about reducing submarine accidents. Apparently, the Elwin room ran out of chairs for the engineers who flocked to hear him. And for Geography and Adventure, this, that, that's the program that I run at BRLSI, on the 25th of September 2013, he chatted about the brass industry of the Avon Valley, 1700 to 1927, a joint talk with science and technology. Tony knows more about it than most as he's chair of Saltford Brass Mill, where he's hosted many visitors, not least BBC television at various levels and also the Royal Geographical Society. And only last year he recorded for Geography and Adventure at BRLSI a video on the ingenious Mr Padmore, which now adorns our YouTube channel. Well, he, the ingenious one, was an unsung engineer, well he was until Tony got hold of him, who used steam power 50 years before James Watt and created a tramway system to get Ralph Allen's stone from Coombe down to the River Avon, many other things. Tonight, Tony is talking about another unsung hero and I can't wait to hear him. It's about Admiral Bertram Ramsey hero of two world wars, two world wars. Without any more ado, ladies and gentlemen, Commander Tony Coverdale. Right, thank you. I think is the screen is bright, Dick, can, can everybody see it? Yep. Right, so Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey. The, um, I say, it's, it's a person that very few people seem to have heard of, and yet when you see what he's been involved with, it's, uh, it's, that's, that's quite a surprise. I first came across him at this place, the Royal Naval College at Greenwich. Um, I was there in the uh, in the 70s uh, and again a few times after that, but that's where I first met him. And um, if you, the, the steps you can see there across between the two buildings, underneath there runs what's called the Chalk Walk. It's a passageway that runs from one side of the college to the other. And each of those um, alcoves, uh, there used to be paintings of Second World War admirals. And this was the painting of Admiral Ramsey. And um, I'd heard of most of the admirals, but not Admiral Ramsey, which intrigued me. And you see him stood looking at a chart uh, in front of a, of a wall map. And that wall map is, is this wall map, which still exists. It's in a place called uh, Southwick House, uh, down as part of HMS Dryad near Portsmouth. And it's a, it's a map showing the disposition of fleets uh, at the Normandy landings. And doing a bit more digging, what I found was that uh, Ramsey was instrumental in a number of major operations in the Second World War. Uh, Dunkirk, what was called the Channel Dash, uh, the landings in North Africa, the landings in Sicily, the landings in Normandy, and lastly, uh, oper Operation Infatuate, which is uh, going in towards um, um, the, down at Walkenham in, uh, in uh, southern, Hol uh, southern Holland. So let's talk a little bit about the past of, of Ramsey. How did he get to this position? Well, he actually was a son of a, of a Brigadier General. He was born into a military family, third son of Brigadier General William Ramsay, who was, and he was actually born at Hampton Court Palace, where his father was, uh, was, uh, was uh, stationed uh, in, in the 1880s. Interestingly, uh, Lieutenant Winston Spencer Churchill joined the Fourth Hussars, uh, uh, William Ramsay's regiment, in 1895. And uh, Churchill did remember seeing Bertram as a boy at Aldershot. So there were links between these two great men at, uh, at quite an early time. 
although I don't think either would have realized what uh, they were to be destined for. Um, now, as a third son, it was an expensive job to become a uh, to become an army officer. In fact, I think when uh, when Churchill uh, uh, joined the army, uh, it would have cost him five years uh, pay just to buy his uniform. So it was uh, not not something for people without private means. And so uh, Ramsey uh, saw to to get himself into the navy, which was a uh, which was a much cheaper option. At age 15, he joined HMS Britannia and Hindustan, the precursor of the Dartmouth Naval College, uh, and uh, served as a cadet. Uh, from his time as a cadet, he went on to serve in, uh, as a sub-lieutenant uh, in HMS Hyacinth, which was a protected cruiser. And interestingly, uh, in 1904, he was involved in a, in a, in a landing, uh, an opposed landing, at the Battle of Illig in, uh, in, in East Africa. And you can see the boats there being lowered from, uh, from Hyacinth. Those were the sorts of boats that were used for the landing. And this is actually a picture, not that Ramsey was involved in this, this is the landing at Gallipoli. And you can see that's the nature of, a, of an amphibious landing uh, before and during the First World War. So that's what uh, was happening in, in, in Ramsey's youth. Uh, from there, in 1906, he was appointed a signals officer to HMS Dreadnought. Uh, the, 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 the new revolutionary battleship. And at that time, it was seen in the Navy that the way to get ahead was to become a gunnery officer. That was the way to the top. But Ramsey didn't, didn't go that way. He, he went into signals. He recognized that communications were key. Also in 1913, he attended the war staff course. At that point, staff training was not something that the Navy engaged in. In fact, the 1913 course was only the second course. Uh, and from there, he was uh, appointed back to HMS Dreadnought, where he was flag lieutenant, signals officer, and on the war staff. And a war, a war trained officer was quite rare in, in those days. The, the belief was that you would do as you were told till you achieved achieve flag rank. And at that point, you would somehow magically uh, become to master uh, strategy and tactics. Um, and uh, Ramsey was, was pretty well outspoken about, uh, ab about events. In fact, uh, three quotes were that uh, early in 1914, was he said, our peace training is defective. Our gunnery officers and officers of the quarters are absolutely ignorant about fleet tactics. And it's obviously that one exists only for the other. And of his, uh, and of his boss, uh, a vice admiral, he said he won't admit that a knowledge of war is at least necessary for any officers until they come to flag rank but how are they to learn it? And he also had uh, thoughts about uh, submarine warfare. He said that uh, if a ship were hit by a, tor uh, by a, uh, a submarine, uh, she, should expect, she should expect no assistance. And his vice admiral said, I thought he was blood bloodthirsty and pessimistic. Uh, why should he always think the worst of things? And a month after he said that, HMS Hogue was torpedoed and sunk, uh, followed shortly by HMS Cress Cressy and Abacur, uh, that stopped to pick up survivors uh, with great loss of life. So, uh, so uh, Ramsey was, was, was uh, ahead of his uh, thoughts at that time. Uh, if we look at uh, what um, the, 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 wor the world looked like in 1914, uh, Ramsey was actually appointed to, to um, uh, serve in what was called the, the, the Dover Squadron. Uh, the red line there you can see is the, is the, the rough line of the, the, the front line throughout the First World War. And the role of ships in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Dover squadron was they were based at Dover and Dunkirk. And the role was to prevent enemy German shipping coming through the, through the channel, in particular submarines. Uh, and uh, that was, was his role. Uh, and in that, he was promoted and in 1915 took command of Monitor M24. Now, M24 was a, was a small coastal vessel, but armed with a very large gun. Uh, a, a nine inch or a 12 inch gun. And uh, these were used for, uh, for uh, what we would now call naval gunfire support onto the coast of, uh, of, of uh, Northern France, uh, where the, the, uh, the front line came up towards the, uh, the, the sea. And so he had experience of, of coastal operations uh, in command of, of this specialized coastal vessel. He then took command of HMS Brook, so he was in command of, uh, of a destroyer in the Channel Squadron, so we've known these waters well. And then after the war, uh, promoted to commander, 
he went to become the executive officer of, uh, of HMS Bembo, a, uh, a, a battleship. And these were the, the, the pride of the fleet at that time. This was the, the heart of the, of, of the, of the, uh, the fleet that served at, uh, at, um, at Jutland. Uh, and as an executive officer, he set about managing the, the, the ship's company in a, in a different sort of way. It was reported to him that, about him that he said his secret of success lay in organising a company along modern lines so that responsibilities were widely distributed. And officers and men would be thankful to find themselves, find themselves in a well-run ship and they would work with a will to reach the standard to which he, the executive officer, aimed. So he organised his, uh, his, uh, his, his ship in a very different way on behalf of his captain. And, and that was something that was key to the way he was to, uh, to run his affairs into the future. Uh, well, as we'll also see shortly, it was also almost to become his downfall. He then went on in 1925 to, to command the light cruiser HMS Denai, uh, and then went back to Greenwich, uh, where he was an instructor on the senior officer's war course as a captain. Uh, and here he was able to, uh, to mix with other military officers, uh, army uh, and the, uh, the, the, the newly formed air force, uh, and also to, to think about the, uh, the greater art of war, which was, uh, which was, which was key to his uh, future, future achievements. From there, he went on to command HMS Kent in the, uh, on the China station. He was in command, <coughs> also flag captain and chief of staff to the Admiral there. So again, he's, he's in a position of, uh, of a key management responsibility in a, in a large organization. And from there on, he went on to command HMS uh, Sovereign, a, a, a battleship. And from there, he was actually appointed to, uh, to, to flag rank. Uh, he was appointed to, uh, to Rear Admiral in, in May 1935, having spent the previous 29 years uh, at sea, 13 of them in command. And the, the, um, the um, commander in chief of the, um, the home fleet, which was the major fleet uh, responsible for operations around Britain and into the Atlantic, was, uh, was Admiral Sir Roger Backhouse. And Backhouse actually requested Ramsey to join him as his chief of staff. Now, the problem here was that the two men had completely different views about how the world should be managed that uh, Backhouse was a man who thought very much in terms of, of material. Uh, he, was, um, he, be he believed in centralised control uh, and, and passed his orders uh, uh, down directly without using a staff. Ramsey, though, believed in modern, st the modern staff system. That was, is, the detail was decentralised and flag officers stood back and had more time to think. And... Uh, this, the two came into direct conflict, that uh, he was uh, appointed as, um, as chief of staff uh, in December 1935, sorry, in, uh, earlier in 1935, but uh, by 1935, he'd asked to be relieved, that, uh, that although he'd been invited to join him as a chief of staff, he just wasn't used, and they had a completely different way of, of managing, managing the world, and so Ramsey uh, stood back and said, I, I, I can't do this. And he, he asked to be relieved and he stood down from active service and was placed on, on half pay. And this was, uh, was, was a real blow to his career. Uh, he, uh, after two years on half pay, uh, he actually wrote to Winston Spencer Churchill, who was then a backbencher, uh, explaining his situation. Uh, and Churchill said he was able to do anything as a backbencher. Uh, but he did have uh, 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 sort of words in certain ears, uh, and uh, Ramsey was offered to become the senior naval officer at Yangtze. Now that was very much a backwater. It was the last job before retirement, uh, and uh, Ramsey declined. And in 1938, October 1938, uh, Ramsey was placed on the retired list, not having flown his flag at sea. So we were then in a position that Ramsey's career was was, was at an end uh, in 19. 1938. However, later that year, uh, September 1938, uh, we, we see the, uh, the, the, the Munich crisis. And uh, with the Munich crisis, uh, there was uh, a, a, a move to look at how we would, we would remobilize. And with that, there were various flag posts around Britain that were dormant. One of them was, was Dover. And uh, Backhouse actually uh, uh, recommended 
um, Ramsey to be brought back on the retired list uh, to become Flag Officer Dover. Now Dover was a uh, was a, a a junior admiral to Flag Officer Nor based in Chatham, and so the admirals you have a centralised command in Nor, and then he then had command with uh, with Flag Officers uh, in in areas of Harwich, Dover, Brightlingsea, and so uh, Ramsey had Dover, but at that point there was nothing in Dover. There were no officers, no wireless communications, no ships, and so. Uh, Ramsey uh, arrived to set up a, a, an organization fr from nothing. Um, and by uh, the end of the crisis, uh, he, he had a, an embryo uh, uh, staff organization in Dover. And then Ramsey was stood down, but then with the, uh, with the onset of war, uh, he was actually promoted to vice admiral, still on the retired list, uh, and was appointed as flag officer Dover. And so from there, uh, when the war started in 1939, Ramsey, uh, sorry, yeah, Ramsey uh, was, uh, was built up the organization so to, for Dover to become an operational, uh, an operational sea area. Now, the, the main role, as they saw it, was going to be to form an anti-submarine barrier by mining the area to stop submarines coming up from Germany into the Atlantic, to look at contraband control of merchant ships, uh, and... Um, one of the things he did uh, of his own volition was to create a telephone link uh, to Boulogne and to Dunkirk, which was to prove invaluable uh, uh, later on. Now, early in 1939, uh, or 10th of May, the German invasion of, of the Low Countries occurred. Um, the troops had fallen back to Hook uh, in, in Holland, and on the 14th of May, uh, Ramsey evacuated a, a, a group from Hook. On the 20th of May, there was a conference held at Dover with the War Offices and the Ministry of Shipping, uh, looking at how they would evacuate the army if required. And this is where the, the, the story of the little ship starts, because that's where they set about um, uh, requisitioning pleasure steamers, coastal vessels, small craft, and pulling boats in particular to, uh, to get people off, off the shores. And on the 22nd of May, uh, Operation Dynamo was, uh, was, 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 put in, uh, was put into force, which was to become, as we all know, the Dunkirk evacuation. Now, normally, uh, the, the, uh, the, the in charge was Commodore Knorr, and the, the, the first sea lord uh, believed that Commodore Knorr should, should take, uh, should take uh, charge. Um, however, the, uh, there were admirals at, at Knorr and also at Portsmouth, and they both recognised that Ramsey was, was, was perfectly able and, and was, was well in charge. And so they set about uh, collecting vessels uh, from their two port areas to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to support Ramsey. And on the 26th of May, which was the first full day of, uh, of Dynamo, the, the operation was, was reinforced and the, and the evacuation got underway. Now, when you look at what happened, that's what uh, the, the, uh, the Northern Europe looked like 1914. So that's what, what, uh, what Ramsey remembered. If we did, uh, go a little bit closer, uh, the 25th of May, uh, the German forces had actually uh, come from the south and, and moved north and uh, were, were facing the British Expeditionary Force uh, uh, up off Calais. They were facing the, the, the French army uh, towards the south and the Belgian army to, to, the, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the east. And that uh, three days later, uh, they cut off the French army and were pushing the, uh, the, the British army back to Dunkirk. And by the 31st of May, uh, the army were trapped in a small corridor along Dunkirk. Now, Ramsey had three routes to get back to, to Dover. Uh, route Z was the, was the shortest route. But that brought the vessels right along the, the, to the coast in front of Calais, where there were German uh, heavy guns. So that exposed those retreating forces to, uh, to, to, to uh, gunfire from, from shore. The uh, Route X uh, was, uh, was next in line. That went north through sandbanks and minefields and then came, turned uh, south about and into Dover. Now that was, uh, was, was removed the, uh, the, the, the risk of gunfire but it exposed you to mines and sandbanks and it couldn't be used at night. And so the night route was actually route Y, which was the longest route, but then that took you further to the, uh, to the, to the northeast, which exposed you to, uh, to um, aircraft attack and, and seaborne attack from German forces. So those were the three routes 
that Ramsey had available to him. And uh, over the, uh, the, the next um, uh, nine days, uh, Ramsey managed to evacuate a huge number of, of, of troops. Now, it must be remembered here, Ramsey is only evacuating people. He's not evacuating equipment. So all the army's equipment was left in, it was left in Europe. But here we can see what all those small boats were used for. They were used for, uh, for uh, getting people off the beaches. Uh, and it was actually uh, Captain Tennant, uh, one of his staff, who was landed as the beach master. And he recognised that, that, the, that the port of Dunkirk was, couldn't be used. It was just too vulnerable. Uh, there were two moles which weren't designed as, as wharfs. They were designed to, to, to protect the, uh, the, 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 the harbour from the sea. But he could get ferries alongside those. Otherwise, it was to get people off, off, the, off the shallow sand. And hence the small boats got the people off the sand onto bigger boats and then eventually back onto destroyers and, 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 and ferries to bring them back to the UK. And so that was the scene in, 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 uh, in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in Normandy. And you can see of that, he managed over those nine days to evacuate uh, over 300,000, uh, mostly British, but also some, uh, some uh, uh, French uh, and Belgian troops. Uh, he had under his command some 765 vessels, uh, of which 218 were lost in the heavy uh, uh, air attacks. In fact, on the 1st of June, uh, my grandfather was serving in HMS Basilisk, which was a destroyer very much like one you see on the screen here, and they were sunk. Uh, my, my, my grandfather survived, but uh, his, uh, his accounts there, he was picked up, taken back to Dover. And very quickly the, uh, in Dover, the, the troops were moved out by rail to get them away from the port. So the port didn't become overwhelmed. And he was back at home in Liverpool within two days, which actually caused different problems. If you can imagine going from being in the thick of war and sunk to being in a pub in your hometown where people just aren't what no experience of war it was a very radical change uh, but that's a, that's a different uh, a different story but that was what that's operation dynamo and that's what uh, what ramsey achieved off the uh, off, off the back foot and in fact uh, out of that uh, ramsey was actually honored uh, with a uh, a knight commander of the bath a kcb so his uh, his, his efforts were, were well recognized now from there ramsey remained in command of dover and Ramsey was then the uh, was is, was uh, uh, in in communication then with with Churchill, who was then Prime Minister, about how to defend Dover and how to, and what to do in the event of invasion. And this brought Ramsey into close contact with a number of other military people who were to be significant. One was General Alan Brooke, the Commander in Chief of the Home Forces, uh, and the other was Lieutenant General Montgomery, who was commanding Twelve Corps, uh, and they had formed in 1940. Uh, and they were the, the, the home defence forces in the early part of, of, of World War II, uh, based at, uh, at Tunbridge Wells. And so the, uh, this was important because uh, Ramsey uh, learned to, to work with some influential people in the highest level of politics and also in the other disciplines. He was a, he was a naval man, but also understood the army and also, as we'll see, the Air Force. Um, one event which was probably a, a nadir of his time in, uh, in, um, in Dover was uh, the Operation Fuller, otherwise known as the Channel Dash. Uh, the Germans had a, had a squadron of ships, two battleships, Scharnholz and Neisenau, a heavy cruiser, uh, Prince Eugen, and a collection of uh, their supporting vessels uh, in Brest. And they were, um, they were a threat to the Atlantic convoys. However, the Hitler believed that we were going to, to change our focus to, to Norway. And so Hitler wanted that force back into Germany to be able to counterattack uh, against in, in, in Norway. And in February 1942, they, they, they sailed uh, out of, uh, of, uh, of Brest with the aim of getting north. Now, bearing in mind that in, in late 1941, uh, a similar operation out in the Far East, uh, we had in quick succession lost uh, HMS uh, Repulse uh, and the Prince of Wales. So it was seen that big ships were very vulnerable. And there was a, that, uh, that these, these forces to, to counter the, the, the Germans were under Ramsey's control. And the, uh, the, uh, the plan was that, um, that, he, that Ramsey had uh, a, a, a small flotilla, 32 motor torpedo boats in Dover. He had motor gunboats to escort them. 
Uh, he had uh, torpedo swordfish bombers. He had Dover's coastal guns. And he also had bomber command in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in reserve to be able to attack any force trying to transit the, uh, the, the, uh, the channel. Uh, we also had uh, uh, embryonic radar, so it was believed that we would be able to detect, detect them in early, in, in good time, and then set the, uh, set the trap. However, they, uh, they sailed, uh, the, the Germans sailed uh, in the, uh, on the 11th of, uh, of, of February, and uh, they, uh, they managed through bad weather, uh, problems with equipment, and good luck on the German behalf, bad luck on ours, they managed to sail through our patrol uh, without being spotted. Uh, and in fact, it was some 12 hours before they were detected when they were up uh, between Boulogne and Dieppe. Uh, and that's where a, a Spitfire squadron uh, detected them. And uh, that then set uh, the, the, the plan into, into action, but at very much short notice. Um, the, the motor torpedo boats were the first in. They managed to engage at uh, 12.23. So uh, that's uh, uh, only two hours after the, the, the fleets were detected. But by that point, they were through the, the narrows of the Dover Channel. Uh, there was also gunfire from Dover. Uh, but again, there was uh, bad weather and the, the ships could hardly be seen from Dover. So although they were firing in the right direction, they couldn't cease fall of shot to, uh, to correct their, their, their action. So, so no damage from, from Dover's guns. Um, a swordfish attack, torpedo, a bomber attack was, was carried out at 12.50. But the problems in coordinating the RAF uh, fighter cover and the fleet air arm swordfish uh, meant that the, fleet, the fighter cover didn't arrive. So the swordfish went into attack without fighter cover. And they were, uh, they, they were, they, they, there were no hits on the, uh, on, on the, on the German ships. And, and sadly, there were quite a few losses on the British behalf. Uh, one, the, the leader of the group, uh, Lieutenant Commander Esmond, did get a, a posthumous Victoria Cross out of it, but no damage to the, uh, to, to the German flotilla. Uh, Sean Horst managed to pass over a minefield and was mined at, at, uh, at 1431 on the, on the 12th. Uh, and then a group of destroyers went into attack at 1545. But again, they were overwhelmed by the, uh, by the aircraft cover uh, and the e-boats from the, from the Germans. And then the RAF attacked at 1455. Uh, the ships, though, uh, got through relatively unscathed. Scharnhorst was, was mined again uh, at, uh, at, uh, uh, later on that evening. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the ships did get through to, uh, to, to Germany. So it was, a, um, it was a, not, a, not a good time. Uh, certainly it caused Churchill to, uh, to uh, order a full investigation as to what went wrong. <clears throat> Problems were seen with, um, with coordination of the RAF forces, and the, and, uh, but um, Ramsey uh, was, was not held at fault. His plans were there, but uh, because they didn't have the due notice, they were able to put them fully into action. Next, then, if we if we go forward, then jump forward, then a couple of months to July 1942. By this time, plans are, are looking to looking ahead to to try and get back into Europe. At this point, uh, the, um, the, uh, the America had joined the war after Pearl Harbor in 19, August 1941. And there was a, uh, a drive to get a, a pushback uh, in, into Europe. Uh, and um, because of the experience with Dunkirk and also his staff experience, uh, Ramsey was actually uh, asked to go up and, and advise uh, on to the setting up of the expeditionary force. So much so, though, uh, quite surprising to Ramsey, he was actually invited to become the naval commander in chief of the, uh, of, of the expeditionary force. So he was then promoted again to the rank of full admiral, but still on the retired list. And he was, he was directed to plan the invasion of France and the Low Countries to direct all naval forces in landing and establishment on the enemy coast and to train the expeditionary forces in combined operations. So this was, uh, this was quite a, uh, a move forward. Uh, and so uh, what Ramsey was faced with, that this is uh, what Europe looked like uh, now in, in German hands. Uh, and um, the Americans were keen to, 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 to get into Europe very quickly. And they were pushing for an operation which became as Operation Roundup, which would take the shortest route from, uh, from the Dover area into Calais. 
Now, the British were, were, uh, were, were, were lukewarm to this. They recognized the problems they'd had in both the First World War and the evacuation of Dunkirk. And they didn't believe we were capable of getting back to that well-defended corner of, of France. They preferred a, a uh, Operation Sledgehammer, which was to go to move uh, out towards Cherbourg uh, and uh, take the Cherbourg Peninsula to set up a, a, a bridgehead there and then to move into Europe. And so um, Ramsey set about uh, working on these two uh, operations uh, with uh, to to uh, to to, to um, set forces in motion. Now, there was a, a great push to want uh, an offensive ground action in Europe uh, as much as anything to uh, to relieve Russia on the on, on the uh, on the Eastern Front. Uh, and uh, so the next push then was to 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 uh, pause these this planning and to think about a, a push into North Africa. And so Ramsey was uh, was was turned from planning the, the, the push into Europe to look at, at a um, at uh, a plan to, to land troops in North Africa. Uh, and this was to be a combined uh, American and British uh, task force. Uh, and we and it was actually to bring people, forces in from a, a long way away. The US assault force were to come in from uh, from America and the, the UK assault forces were to come in from Northwest Scotland. So these forces had to travel a long way into the into the into their uh, into, into theater and then land in a, in, in a coordinated attack. Now, there was from the, the, uh, the army, they were keen to land, uh, to get on land as quickly as possible. Whereas Ramsey pushed to have two further landing ports as far up the coast as you could, because he recognized the further you could get by sea, the, the less the army would have to do. This is where he was thinking both as a, as a, as a, as a general and, and as an admiral, uh, which we'll see more of uh, shortly. Uh, and so in, uh, in uh, planning the operation, um, uh, um, what became Operation Torch, uh, he was first of all in, uh, in, in America, planning with, with, the, with the Americans. And for that, he had several hours discussion directly with the president of America about how this might go. So he's in direct discussion with Roosevelt. And Eisenhower was appointed in overall command of the, of the operation. But because um, Ramsey was still on the retired list, it was in, it was uh, it wasn't practical for him to remain uh, a sea going in sea going command. So Admiral Cunningham was actually appointed to be the supreme Allied naval commander. But Ramsey planning the whole the whole show, and Ramsey stayed into in command right up until mid October, when he handed over to Cunningham, uh, who then accepted the uh, the command and carried out the assault. Uh, and so in doing this. We have not only to the plan of, uh, of landing, but we've also got to, uh, to, to counter uh, the submarine threat in the Atlantic. And in fact, at this point, uh, the escort forces had to be redirected re uh, to cover these landing forces, exposing the Atlantic convoys to, uh, to, to much more uh, uh, submarine attack. Um, poor weather, of course, uh, into the, from the Atlantic. And also there was the concern about how would the, how would the French respond to, to, to these opposed landings? Would they, uh, would they capitulate and fall in with the Allies or would they, would they, stay, would they fall in with the, with the Germans and fight the landings? So it's a, a, a complex uh, landings. Uh, and this is a picture of, uh, of the, one of the, the, um, the, um, the American forces landing in, uh, in, in North Africa. And to look at some statistics, at this point, Operation Torch had 200 warships, 350 merchant ships uh, uh, and a thousand aircraft. And between them, uh, they, they, they managed to land 70,000 troops at the, at the three landing spots of Casablanca, Iran and Algiers. So there's, some, so there's the statistics of, uh, of, of Torch. Now from Torch, the, uh, the, 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 the move then was they still haven't forgotten about Europe. But the belief was if we then moved north uh, and went into Italy, uh, as what became known as uh, Europe's soft underbelly, uh, further advances could be made. And so Ramsey was then, then moved from, uh, uh, from still, uh, he was still in overall command of the invasion of Europe, but was redirected to, uh, to, to plan the, uh, the invasion uh, of Europe from the south. 
uh, and at the uh, Casablanca conference where uh, where the 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 the, um, the three leaders of America, Russia, uh, and and Britain uh, um, met, it was agreed that uh, the uh, that the next attack would be to Sicily. Uh, and Ramsey this time was nominated naval commander, British assault forces into Sicily. And so here, what he had to do was to work again with the uh, with the um, with 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 the army, uh, and also he worked closely with with Montgomery. Uh, and this was was to be key because Montgomery, obviously, a very forceful character. Uh, the plans that the rough plans they had for Sicily weren't right for the army, and they weren't right for the navy. So the plans were, 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 were made and remade. Meanwhile, there's training going on in Britain, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Scotland, in, in America, in North Africa and Egypt. Uh, and plans are made to bring convoys from those four areas to synchronize landing at, uh, uh, around Malta and then to, to land on the, uh, on the south of, uh, of Sicily. Uh, and um, from there that, um, a, uh, uh, that um, Ramsey was uh, was uh, had a, a, an interesting compliment from uh, from um, from from uh, Montgomery that uh, they were giving a, a joint uh, a brief on uh, on the uh, uh, on the uh, on the on the plan uh, and uh, so General Montgomery uh, arrived in Cairo to address his future corps commanders and generals and brigadiers. And Ramsey asked if his own staff might, might join in the briefing so he could see solidarity between, between army and, and navy. And uh, interesting to hear that Ramsey, that uh, Montgomery then introduced Ramsey, he said he'd, uh, that he had a battle winning plan, which General Ramsey had entirely approved. And he says, I'll now ask General Ramsey to present the naval side of the detail. Now, was Montgomery pulling Ramsey's leg? Was Montgomery so impressed with him that he said uh, he was prepared to call him a general uh, uh, or did he make a mistake? And so Ramsey then started, uh, when he stood up to speak, said, uh, I feel I'm doubly qualified to talk to you as soldiers this morning for not only an admiral, but I'm also a general. And so that showed you how that Ramsey was able to work closely with, uh, with, with, with the army uh, and with such characters as Patton to, to organize the, the naval forces. And this time, Ramsey was actually allowed to take command at sea. Uh, this is a, 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 a couple of photographs of, uh, of British troops uh, landing uh, in, in, in Sicily. Uh, and uh, here we can see the sorts of, of, of ships we've now got, uh, the specialised landing ships. Ramsey actually flew his flag in HMS Antwerp, which was uh, an old cross-channel uh, steamer. Um, this was where his, his, his command was, uh, was, was actually based, because all you need really is, 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 is plotting rooms and good communications uh, and a few guns to defend yourselves. Uh, you're not part of the, of the offensive force, you are part of command and control. And so this is where uh, Ramsey uh, flew his flag. Uh, but to look at the ships under his command, this is a landing ship tank. So this is a, is, a, is a larger vessel that can get right into the beach to, uh, to, uh, to drop tanks ashore. This is a landing craft tank, a, a smaller vessel, uh, which again will land tanks. And in fact, uh, you, some of you may have seen that this is one that's recently been restored, the, 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 the last of the uh, landing craft tanks. So there is a, a full-blown uh, landing craft tank, which I think you can go and see down in, uh, down in Portsmouth. Uh, landing craft flak which is, a, uh, is a, the same hull, but now adapted to take anti-aircraft guns, or a landing craft gun, a, 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 again, a similar craft with heavier gun, not unlike uh, the, the, the monitor that Ramsey had commanded in the First World War uh, to provide gunfire support, and of course the, the, the landing craft for the personnel, landing craft personnel to get them ashore. And there in the background, you can see rafts for transporting ships from the merchant ships uh, onto the beach. So these are the sorts of vessels that, that Ramsey has got under his control. And in, in Husky, again, some, uh, some, uh, some statistics here. Now 160,000 men were landed with 14,000 vehicles, 600 tanks, 1,800 guns, 3,000 aircraft, and overall he had command of 3,200 vessels. In fact, uh, up that uh, uh, Mountbatten, uh, who accompanied Ramsey at this point, uh, said, um, uh, reported, I accompanied Admiral Ramsey on board the Antwerp on D-1, and I saw all the convoys as they passed on the way to their rendezvous south of Malta. 
I have been 27 years at sea, and I've never seen a sign like it in my life. It was like a spithead review multiplied by 20. There were just forests of masts in every direction, so far as the eye could see. It was the most imposing and inspiring sight, and all troops and sailors had their tails so obviously vertical that you went anywhere you needed, they, were broke, they broke into cheers. So there you can see the scale of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of the landings in Sicily. And again, the, uh, the, the, the success was, uh, the landing was a great success, uh, bringing these troops in from, from all these distant quarters. Interestingly, my, my father was also uh, in this operation in the destroyer. Uh, and uh, later, later on, the, 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 the action moved to, uh, to the north of, of Sicily. Uh, and uh, uh, my father was actually one of three destroyers, which were the first warships to pass, or allied warships, to pass through the Straits of Messina. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, both my father and grandfather uh, were around in, in, in Ramsey's actions. Um, so there was, was Husky. Now, Ramsey was still in command of the, of, of the, uh, of the expeditionary force. So he was brought back to Europe. Uh, and then uh, in July 43, was was appointed as naval commander uh, uh, of the uh, of the of the expeditionary force, uh, and um, here we can see the the, the, the key planners uh, sitting around the table. There we have um, uh, Lieutenant General Omar Bradley. Uh, uh, they're looking from sorry from left to right. Omar Bradley. Uh, there's uh, Admiral Ramsey, uh, Air Marshal Tedder, who was the Deputy Supreme Commander. Eisenhower, who was a supreme commander, uh, General Montgomery, who was the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the the uh, British Army commander, and Air Marshal Lee Mallory, with uh, Lieutenant Bedell, uh, Lieutenant General Bedell Smith, who was Chief of Staff to the Supreme Commander. So those are the key players of planning uh, Operation Neptune, which was the landings uh, at Normandy. Um, that is a picture that you will uh, be, you'll probably see many times uh, with the various beaches, uh, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno and Sword. But there you can see the, 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 uh, the, the forces approaching uh, and, and the general arrangements for landing in that area. Now, we all know about the landings. Of course, the, the, the planning takes, uh, is, there's four elements to this. There is the plan, which is the pre-planning about what you're going to do. There's the prelude, which is the build-up of the forces, then the grand assault itself. But that isn't where it ends. You've then got the build-up, because once the troops are ashore, you've got to continue that flow of, of equipment into the beachhead to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to enable the army to do its business. And, and it's, it's the whole of that plan that Ramsey is responsible for. Ramsey is responsible for uh, the, the plan. For, for getting the forces in Britain uh, uh, in the prelude to actually then coordinating the assault and also uh, with the, the, the littoral, the, the forces along the, the shoreline are still under Ramsey's control. So Ramsey is still uh, coordinating the fighting on the shoreline and it only comes under the, under, the, under, the, uh, under the army control once they've left the beachhead and are moving inland. So that's where, where Bradley and Montgomery take over. Uh, so there's several talks just in, in, in that in itself, but uh, to think of some of the things that Ramsey has got to be thinking about, he's got to be thinking about the army's intentions, about, about where to land. He's got to be thinking about the maritime side of things, the navigation, tide, the weather. And in both this and Operation Torch, weather conditions were actually marginal. They were both on the edge of should it go ahead or not. And interestingly, that both worked to Ramsey's favour because on both occasions, Ramsey, from his knowledge of the weather, said go ahead, whereas the Germans had stood down believing they wouldn't land in that sort of a weather. So the weather worked to his advantage. You've, uh, once you've uh, got people ashore, in fact, a, a, little, a little nuance in there was that to try and get intelligence of the beach, uh, we had small submarines that went in, in shore and landed special hydrographic officers to actually measure the beach. But also they, uh, they, they, uh, they acquired as many photographs as possible of people on holiday there. So when you've got your mother-in-law paddling, uh, it gives you a good indication of depth of water as to how far out she is. So all these little elements of intelligence were gathered together. Um, then once the attack starts, they, the Navy are providing naval gunfire support. And in fact, as we'll see, that uh, Ramsey had five battleships, which the rest of the Navy were desperate to take off him. But he said, no, that's what we need. And those five battleships were able to, pr to provide heavy gun support into the, uh, into the, uh, into the army. 
And then once we're assured that that buildup is more people, more ammunition, more water and food, more artillery, more vehicles, more fuel. And so that's what Ramsey is planning. Uh, and then once the army can take to, can start taking ports, uh, that the, what uh, Ramsey has to do is to send in forces to clear the port of the harbours and which have been heavily booby trapped. And this is where the, the concept of the mine clearance diver comes in to actually clear those booby traps and open the port for use. And all this and all the time you've got the 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 the, the seaborne threat from the air, from mines, from e-boats, from submarines, and from guns. So a very complex operation. Uh, and again, some statistics: five battleships, twenty-eight major warships, sixty destroyers, seventy-six frigates, two hundred and forty-seven minesweepers, uh, over fourteen hundred landing ships and landing craft. And, and a, 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 a over 1,100 minor vessels uh, for, for getting things ashore. So a huge, a huge operation. And this is a, a picture which you've probably seen elsewhere. This is, uh, I think this is D-Day plus, uh, plus one or plus two, to show you that buildup of those forces uh, uh, coming ashore. And, and it's, the, uh, it's the planning and loading of all these ships. Nothing is taken to chance. And uh, here we see at sea on the day of D-Day, we have Ramsey on the bridge of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of Antwerp uh, and there with Admiral Vian, who's the uh, commander of, his, uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of one of his task groups and uh, Air Marshal Tedder, who's the Deputy Supreme Commander. And that's what it's like at the front line. That's a, 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 some, uh, a, a landing craft personnel of, of American troops going ashore. And uh, so if we then stand back and now think about the, the four operations that we've just looked at, that Dynamo, uh, with, with minimal planning, brings off 300,000 people, no equipment, but 300,000 people uh, with uh, 82 warships. By torch, he's got 200 warships and 350 merchant ships to take 70,000 people and their equipment. Husky, we've got 3,200 ships to get 160,000 people ashore, and Neptune, 6,800 ships. So huge forces. Never will we see the like of this again to get those forces ashore. And so that then gets the, the forces into, uh, into, uh, in, into Europe. Um, the, uh, it's interesting to, uh, to, to look a little bit uh, at, uh, at uh, Ramsey's views uh, of, uh, before we go on to this last operation, that, um, that um, talking about his, uh, the, the choice of his junior admirals for, for the forces, uh, Bill Tennant, who had been uh, his captain uh, uh, on the beach at Dunkirk, uh, was one officer for the flag officer British Assault Area. Uh, but in his diary, uh, uh, Ramsey said, uh, Bill Tennant is too flashy for it and too inclined to act independently of and instead of with me. Also, he's prone to think too much of Tennant and too little of his C&C. &C. And of uh, Philip Vine, that was the admiral you saw with him there. Uh, Vine was uh, famous of the, of the Cossack incident, uh, the Altmark, in the, uh, the start of the Second World War. He said, uh, he strikes me as being a little helpless and requires to be given so much guidance on matters, which I feel he can work out for himself. I don't think he uses his staff enough. So he has strong views about the people that he, that he, that he has working for him. Um, also, uh, in the build-up to, uh, to, to Normandy, uh, we've got this, uh, this, this split of American and British forces. And Admiral Kirk was, uh, not James T, another Admiral Kirk, was actually the, uh, one of the commanders uh, of, the, of the task force, uh, the assault area from the American side. And he was concerned about the, uh, but he was actually under Ramsey. And uh, the um, Admiral Kirk uh, bypassed, he was worried about e-boats, e-boat attack. He didn't think Ramsey was doing enough. And he, and he sidestepped Ramsey and went straight to Eisenhower. And Eisenhower went back uh, and uh, uh, complained vehemently to, uh, to, uh, to Eisenhower to say uh, he, he regarded this incident as a violation of the principles of command. And that if the complicated machinery was to run smoothly, the sequence of authority must be followed, irrespective of nationality. So you can see he has strong views about how his command would work. And yet there are very complementary things about people who worked with him. He, uh, he clearly inspired, uh, inspired uh, confidence. He said, uh, he says, one uh, could uh, not have worked for a more considerate or more pat uh, patient master. 
Kalman and Harid in his duties, friendly and kind in his personal relations, he welded us into a team. Now, actually for the landings on, uh, on, uh, on Normandy, this is where uh, Churchill pushed to say, we can't have a, a, a force of this magnitude uh, commanded by, a, by a, an officer on the retired list. And he pushed to have Ramsey put back onto the active list. Now, there was strong opposition from the Navy because they said, well, no, he's, he's, he's fallen out of line. If, if we give him back his, uh, on the active list, we have to push another admiral off it. And the Admiralty actually opposed uh, um, uh, Churchill in putting Ramsey back on the active list. But Churchill came through and, uh, and, and Ramsey was actually uh, appointed back onto the active list and his seniority backdated as if he'd never left the Navy. And so there, Ramsey is now a, 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 a fully blown Admiral on the active list. Uh, and one of his, uh, what, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his deputy chief of staff said this was the only time he ever saw him show any sign of emotion when he heard he'd been restored to the active list of the Royal Navy. He valued it more than any honour and tears came to his eyes. So interesting little snippets there of, of the kind of man that Ramsey was. Now, if you now look at uh, uh, Valkyrie, uh, we're into November 1944 now. Now, this is, uh, is up around, around Antwerp. Now, what had happened since D-Day was that we've seen the landings at D-Day. We've got the troops ashore. There is a move round to, uh, to Cherbourg. We've got the Mulberry Harbours. We've got the, 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 the bridgehead there. And, and we've got, uh, we've got uh, forces building up. Um, and Montgomery, once they, once they managed to break out of the uh, Cherbourg Peninsula, moves much quicker across to, uh, to, uh, to, to Antwerp than, than was expected. Uh, and uh, they were actually, it was actually um, uh, at, at Antwerp uh, by September. Now, this is where the, the, the supply chain is, is, is very long now, coming from round Cherbourg. And in fact, Le Havre was to fall after, after Antwerp. And this is where Ramsey pushed uh, both Montgomery and, and Eisenhower to say what we need to do is we should be looking at where the front line is. This is the front, the German front line. This little uh, leg here, this is the Operation Market Garden. And uh, Arnhem is just off the top there. That was that big army push to, to break up towards the, uh, uh, the Rhine. Uh, but the problem was that we held Antwerp and Antwerp hadn't been badly damaged. But the Germans held both sides of the river here. And so Ramsey pushed to say we ought to attack and take the, uh, the Scheld, and then we can then get a supply route straight into Antwerp. And so that's where, uh, where, where Ramsey pushed. And, uh, and eventually, in October and November 1944, Ramsey's plans were put into action. And with the, the, uh, the, the first British Corps based on Antwerp, Canadian forces coming from the uh, from Antwerp uh, and then uh, around them back into uh, round uh, Zeebrugge and then from the sea we have uh, the, the special forces, 4th Special Service Brigade, Royal Marines and number four commando taking Walcheren and so in this way we were actually able to take both sides of the of the Scheld and then get our supply route once it had been clear of mines into Antwerp and then we then we then got the push uh, up into uh, into Germany so Ramsey is still at the at the at the uh, at the, the, uh, the center of business um, December 1944 that uh, actually a um, uh, Ramsey had taken a bet out with Montgomery that the war would be over by, by, by Christmas. Uh, clearly Christmas was 22nd of December, Christmas was, was, was upon us and the war wasn't over. So, Monk, so uh, Ramsey paid up, he, he sent him a, a check for five pounds and paid up the bet, which uh, Montgomery uh, duly uh, recorded in his betting book as having been paid. Now, sadly, uh, 1st of January, 1945, uh, Ramsey's headquarters are just to the southwest of Paris and uh, Montgomery asked him to fly up to, uh, to, to Brussels to meet him there to discuss the defence of the Scheld. Uh, they took off on the 1st of, of January uh, in a Hudson uh, plane and for various reasons it's felt that the possibly pilot error uh, that, the, uh, that, that the, he took off uh, too slow uh, and turned too early and the plane stalled and crashed. And sadly, the 1st of January uh, 1945, Admiral Bertram Ramsey was killed 
and he's bur buried uh, just outside of Paris in a, in a Commonwealth War cemetery. So our story comes to a remarkably sudden, sudden close. Uh, uh, hopefully you can see that um, he's, uh, the scale of his operations are, are immense. A, a fascinating uh, a general, uh, sort of a general and an admiral, uh, but, um, but one who's, who, is, who is not as well known as others, uh, which I think is, is a great shame. So at that point, I'll, I'll, I'll stop uh, and open for any questions. Well, first of all, Tony, first of all, Tony, can I say thank you very much for a fantastic lecture. I've heard you lecture on many things at many times, um, but the way that you've covered this man's life and brought him, brought him to life for us has been immense. Um, I won't say any more now. I'll give a little vote of thanks at the end. Um, straight on to questions. Uh, everyone can now, if you want to, because this is being recorded, if you uh, want to show yourselves by the, um, the video, that's fine. And But please, only the people who are asking questions unmute. The first question is from John Bennett. John, would you like to unmute, please? Uh, show yourself and, uh, and ask your question. I have a feeling that this is John Bennett, Dr. John Bennett of BRLSI. Correct. And uh, yes, I was just asking whether Ramsey was involved in any way in the attack on Dieppe in 1942. No, Dieppe I'd be interested was... because my father-in-law was there. Thank you. Right. Dieppe is, uh, is, uh, was actually uh, Mountbatten's. That, uh, that, uh, it was an interesting that... Um, now, Batten was, was made commander, uh, commander of the Combined Forces. So as com commander of Combined Forces, uh, he, he, was, he, he masterminded Dieppe. And that was the, the, the aim there was to see, could we actually take a port? Because the, uh, that, uh, clearly it's that, that, that build-up is important. So if you can take a port, you are, you are well on the way. Now, um, so, so as we know, Dieppe was a... Was a uh, uh, it was the great loss of life, and we 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 took the, the the port, but couldn't hold it. So, when Ramsey was then appointed as combined to to, to, to as the commander of the British Expeditionary Forces, there was rivalry then between what was what was a combined operation and what was the Expeditionary Force. So this is and Ramsey then had to come in and take over. Mountbatten's uh, 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 sort of uh, training a program to 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 train people for for the expedition reports. So, and they learnt an awful lot from Dieppe. It was uh, it was something they. That's one of the reasons why we 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 didn't try and take a port. We 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 took our port with us. That was the whole point of, of Normandy. So uh, Ramsey wasn't involved in 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 planning uh, Normandy, uh, planning Dieppe, but he learnt an awful lot from it. Uh, and work then with with Mountbatten to 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 uh, to good effect later on. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. One of our uh, Pete's Pete L has a second question. Pete. Uh, thanks, Dick. Uh, well, it was a double question, really, um, uh, Tony. If you'd survived the war, would you be more famous and recognised today? And also, uh, as a second sort of question, would you have got the five star and uh, obviously got more honours and awards? Um, festooned on him after all his successes? Yes, it's an interesting one, but certainly before 1937, he had been earmarked as probably um, uh, destined for, for the top job. Um, so he certainly had that capability. Um, he was, what, 61 when he died. So certainly there was, a, there was a, 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 another job in him. Um, uh, had he survived, I think he, he would have certainly seen out his, his, his career as a, as, a, as a full admiral. Um, the, um, why wasn't he, he, he recognised? I suppose one of the problems was he, he, the huge achievements, but they weren't the sort of traditional at sea engagements. There wasn't an engagement between major ships and, and ships being sunk. Uh, it was, uh, it's very much in support of, of the army. And that's possibly why he didn't uh, capture imagination. There were a couple of books written uh, about him afterwards, uh, but of course he never wrote his own book. 
uh, the, the other great admirals of the time, uh, Cunningham, um, uh, well, they all wrote their own memoirs so they could then uh, to put, put their own story forward. But that was left to others to do for Ramsey. Uh, but certainly back on the active list, he would have carried on. It's quite possible that he, he could have made, made first sea lord. Uh, certainly, he, he, the, 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 his, uh, at this point when he died, uh, Admiral Cunningham was, was first sea lord and there was a strong uh, affinity between the two men. So, so, yes, I think there was, there was certainly more there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. And John Bennett has got another supplementary question and a different one. John. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, yes, the Mulberry Harbour. I, um, my question was written down as, uh, was he involved in the development of the Mulberry Harbour? I, I mean, imagine that he was very closely involved in so, at some stage because it was so critical to the, to the action. That's right. This is where his, 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 his achievement as a, as, a, as a planner and coordinator are, are, are key. He's, he's not necessarily designing the Mulberry Harbour. But what he is doing is he's, he's in very close contact with what what it is, what it can achieve, uh, and also the, um, the, the 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 Pluto to go with it. So he he knows he, he knows he needs it. And what he does do is he plans how to how to get the Mulberry Harbour across the sea, how to get it uh, it uh, it uh, it stationed, how to get it uh, properly positioned. Uh, and also, once that's there, of course, uh, two days after the landings, they, they get hit by, a, by effectively a hurricane, a, a, a gale, and much of their landing uh, equipment is destroyed. And so out of that, Ramsey then has to, to, to plan again a little bit on the back foot to reinforce that to get the whole operation uh, back up to full strength, which they do in, in, in a number of days. So, uh, so yes, he's very much aware of all the things that are all the tools that are available to him. You know, as we can see, the specialist vessels we've talked about of landing craft. Uh, he's using battleships in a in a different role. Uh, the Admiralty were, were were very suspicious of him because he was using firing so many shells in support of the of the army. He was wearing their guns out, and certainly Mulberry Harbour, Pluto, they are all part of of being able to take the, your your port with you. Uh, because you haven't got one when you're there, so 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 yes, very much part of his uh, of his planning operations. Thank you very much, John. Uh, do we do we ha yes we do we have uh, Bill Shaw. Bill, your question, please. Um, I think you're going to have to unmute, Bill. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, Tony. Very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I was inspected by Mount Batten when I passed out of Dartmouth in '65, uh, and I have mixed opinion of his uh, uh, abilities. Uh, I wondered if we have an indication as to uh, what uh, the uh, Ramsey had uh, of Mount Batten. Certainly, uh, I haven't seen anything about him, what he thought about the, 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 the man himself, but certainly he wasn't very complimentary about the planning that he saw, the, the, the training in particular, because uh, when Ramsey was appointed as the, as the uh, naval commander, part of that was, was, was training. And the training was taking place in, in Scotland, and he went up to Scotland and was not impressed with what he saw. So I think he, uh, he, he didn't think... Uh, he didn't think that Mount Baden had done the best of jobs up there. So, uh, but Ramsey being Ramsey, he didn't, he didn't, uh, um, he didn't labour the fact that somebody had got something wrong. He then he either got rid of them or made sure they got it right. So, uh, so yes, I don't, and certainly he he, uh, he had uh, uh, Mount Baden with him on on uh, on um, HMS uh, Antwerp. So, uh, so the two came close together. So, and I think. Uh, Mount Batten um, did did uh, appreciate what uh, what Ramsey could do, so he didn't try to uh, to uh, to under, undermine him or or uh, or, um, or or divert him. So so yes, I think uh, Ramsey's having seen what Ramsey said about uh, Bill Tennant and Admiral Vine, I think his view might have been that Mount Batten was of the same the same cut. Too interested in Mount Batten and uh, and. Uh, too interested in uh, furthering his own nest. <laughs> yeah, quite so. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. 
Um, I've got a question. If anyone else has questions, just um, stick them on the chat because it's easy to see who's asking a question. Or if you go down to reactions at the bottom, click reactions and then put your thumb up or your hand up um, where it says clap or thumbs up or even heart if you're if you're so insistent um, then we'll be able to see but I can only see one page at a time that's the only problem chats the best thing but I have a question Bill uh, sorry I have a question Tony uh, 6,000 odd warships 170,000 fighting people I'm sure any of our current admirals could organize that, don't you? <laughs> yes, it's a, uh, well, it's interesting, of course, that uh, in the Second World War, they couldn't. I mean, in the First World War, they couldn't. That this, is, this was the whole thing about staff training, that in the First World War, that that's what Ramsey saw, that, that you got to flag rank and somehow magically you would then become master of everything. Um, and in the Second World War, in, in the, after Dunkirk, Certainly, when Dunkirk was, was coming on, the Admiral Pound, who was the first sea lord at the time, uh, directed that the Admiral Knorr in Chatham should take command and Ramsey should, uh, should, should follow that line of command. Unfortunately, the Admiral Knorr at the time said, no, Ramsey knows what he's doing, uh, that myself and the Admiral at Portsmouth should support Ramsey. And in fact, Admiral uh, Cunningham, who was, uh, who was around at the time, actually came in to support Ramsey. And he took the night watch so Ramsey could get some sleep, so Ramsey could think during the day. So three senior admirals around him came in to support him. So that was where we see, so if, if, um, if uh, personalities had got in the way, that would have fallen apart completely. But four people rallied around because they saw he was the man who could do it. And when it came to plan, uh, to plan, um, to, to plan Normandy, uh, yes, it was. Uh, it, he he was he was the man that uh, both the Americans and the, and the British chose. We now have staff training. I remember uh, um, the, the, the 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 amphibious operations bit of uh, of staff training, and it, it, it wasn't a, a major bit of it. It's not something. It, it's there from the sea. Whether we could do it today, I'm not sure. Um, it's 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 somebody who's got that mindset of uh, of of logistics and planning and seeing what everybody else needs. He's not thinking down, down, one, down one route. So there is a, a rare breed. It was the right man at the right time. I suppose the only equivalent that we might have to any of these operations would be the Falklands. Yes, yes. And that's where we saw a, a, a very long supply chain out to, 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 to there. And so, uh, uh, yes. And so between Abel Fieldhouse and uh, uh, and uh, uh, back at back at Northwood, uh, and um, uh, oh, his name's suddenly gone. Um, who was the admiral on the on the on the? Sandy Woodward. Uh, Woodward, Sandy Woodward, of course. Yes, that there they uh, interestingly both submariners, of course. But uh, whether that's uh, uh, that uh, used to fighting out at, at long range with with no support. So uh, so yes, um, but logistics again the key to the thing uh, as. as probably more key than the actual fighting on the ground. We've got a couple more questions. Ian Wilson has given me six or seven different um, emoticons down at the bottom. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I must have uh, been playing around with my keyboard because I didn't actually have a question. Well, we've got my apologies for that. No, are there are two Ian Wilsons. We've got two Ian Wilsons. So ah, sorry. Thank you, Martin. Okay, sorry about that. Um, thanks for your very interesting talk. Um, on Operation Husky, is it correct that the Americans kind of tried to draw up a plan and, and it kind of ended in total disarray and then it got taken over by the British and it was Montgomery and Ramsey that kind of did it by default? And a second question, a, a very obscure question on Husky, is it in your research? Have you come across any of these suggestions that a lot of the intelligence, or a certain amount of the intelligence on the ports and stuff on the ground, was supplied by um, through the mafia, either in New York or in Sicily? Right. On the first question, um, the uh, on that one, yes. That uh, if you remember that Eisenhower is the supreme commander, yeah. and of course, 
he's never fought a land battle. A very capable man, but but he's new. To, he's new to practical warfare. Um, certainly, the, the 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 American system is not set up in what you might call a modern staff system, and there were several plans. Uh, and the um, that uh, yes, that uh, when um, Ramsey uh, and Mount, Mount, uh, Montgomery. Uh, picked up the plans. I think they they said they were both displeased with it. They they sort of rip they ripped them up, and so yes, I think they were on about plan six before before they actually got one that was that they agreed. So uh, so so yes, uh, certainly Ramsey and uh, uh, and um, Ma Mon Montgomery working together uh, were the brains behind putting the troops ashore. So so yes, I think that is that is true. As for the mafia. Uh, I've, I must admit, I haven't seen anything about that uh, in my reports. Uh, the things I've, I've read, I wouldn't be surprised. I think is the uh, is the uh, uh, all's fair in love and war. If uh, if it's if it's uh, if it's um, stupid, but it works. It's not stupid. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. And um, I think Ian Gilchrist had a question, and then John Davis after him. Ian. No, you're mistaken. Uh, I am. You might have been playing with your thumbs up. John, did you have one as well? Uh, no, I think uh, I might have been playing as well. Okay, no worries either way. Uh, may comment, what an excellent presentation. Thank you, Tony. Thanks very much. Um, Ian Gilchrist, uh, music convener at BRLSI and John Davis, ex-science convener at BRLSI. Um, Tony, I think we've. Um, oh, I think we've got another question here from Pete. Pete L. Pete again. Hi, Tony. It was just a quick one. It was about Dunkirk, where um, that slide you showed with all the, the number of ships and the losses, um, obviously both military and civilian. Did Ramsey or any other naval officer have any sort of command or control over that little fleet, or were they just doing their own thing? Oh no, very much in, in, in control. I okay. mean the. Um, one of the things that happened was that uh, that the the boats were requisitioned, and we saw by the by the various the, the, by the neighbouring port admirals and brought through to Dover. Every vessel then had a had a naval person put on board. The larger vessels would have had a junior officer. The smaller vessels a, a leading seaman or a petty officer. So every vessel had a had a a, a naval personnel on board, and uh, they were very much uh, controlled back to uh, to military command. Because the small boats were needed to get uh, up the beach to get the people off the beach, and if you look at those statistics, the, in terms of numbers of people, troops landed, uh, have I got my numbers here? That um, that uh, the boats are not necessarily bringing the the people back to uh, back to Britain. The boats are getting people off the beach <laughs> to a ferry or to a uh, to, to a destroyer, and then those ships are the ones who are bringing them back to the port. So the small boats are the equivalent of the landing craft. They are to get people off the beach. And so um, certainly uh, early, the, the, to early on, uh, Captain Tennant, later Admiral Tennant, was put as the, as the beach master in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Dunkirk. And he had, through that telephone link that we heard between Dunkirk and Dover, there was control there. So it was the coordination of Tennant that got people off the beach. So it was it was a, it was an organised activity. There was certainly no no haphazard about it. it even though it had been uh, uh, organised quickly, it was uh, it was all under naval control. So that was a bit of um, poetic license there with uh, Mark Rylance on Dunkirk, where he just uh, sailed off to, to do his bit without any uh, with the navy guys sat on the uh, on the pontoon. Oh, most certainly. No, that 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 <laughs> that wasn't the situation at all. No. No, I mean, it would have been complete chaos had everybody just done their own yeah. thing. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. As you can see, those those three routes were all important of, of also about uh, how to get back. That uh, if you uh, if you'd gone over simply ad, ad hoc, even the, uh, the, the the cross channel ferries had to follow the the, the, the naval discipline uh, to, to go through the, the, the whichever route it was, X, Y or Z, which was least threat at the time. So coordinating that was key. And then, of course, all back in Dover, you've then got control of the railways to get people out of Dover and away. They, you can't have them all in Dover. You've got to get, you've got to disperse people quickly. So it is a, uh, 
it is, although it's on the back foot, it's not a, uh, it's not ad hoc. Well, I think we've come to the end of questions, uh, Tony, but I've, I've got a, just a little one here that might or might not be correct. Am I correct that the, that Winston Churchill wanted to witness the Normandy landings for himself <laughs> and King George the sixth said, you can't go on your own. I'm coming with you. No, nope, that's, that's definitely true. And, and Admiral Ramsey said, uh, very politely, he said, uh, no, <laughs> that, uh, that um, yes, they, that the, the, the king, because of course the king is, is a Navy man as well, uh, and uh, they both wanted to go and they were determined to go in HMS Belfast. And uh, Ramsey pointed out that uh, he, he would, if ordered, he would make the, the arrangements, but the, the, the threat is there and uh, to lose both your king and prime minister in, in one fell swoop would, would not be good. Uh, and so he persuaded them not to go uh, through uh, through through logic, uh, but they did go uh, not so very long after. So he got them there as soon as possible. But yes, they wanted to be there on day one. They wanted to be on the bridge. Uh, Henry V, you know, sort of once more onto the breach. Credit to all three of them, I say. Well, <laughs> Tony Coverdale, you've done it again. Talk about Operation Dynamo. You are the original, if I can say this, as a retired. Um, naval gentlemen, you are the original human dynamo. And also, I've said it before, and I hope to say it again, you produce the most professional presentations I've seen in 10 years as a convener at Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. So if everyone would like to unmute themselves right now, please, if you'd like to unmute yourselves and give Tony the round of applause he deserves, and can be heard. Let's do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Tony Coverdale. Thank you. That's the end of the presentation. And safe journey home, as we usually <laughs> say.